There you go. Hello everyone, I am Tavian Hunter. I'm the Library and Archive Manager at the Stroke Hall Library at Innova. And yeah, I would like to really welcome you to this artist talk with Maybell Peters and Gary Stewart, where we'll be exploring and delving into um, Innova's archives, specifically XSpace, which, is, which was once Innova's virtual gallery and online project space. Through an open call at the end of 2020, a new digital artist in residency was launched in partnership with the De Decolonizing Arts Institute at UAL as part of their Decolonizing the Archive initiative. And Maybell Peters was selected to undertake the residency at Stuart Hall Library remotely using the archive of XSpace as a research practice study. To give a bit of background about Innova's archives and XSpace, in 2018, Innova began work to list and catalogue its archival collections, which are held within the Stuart Hall Library. The archives document Innova's 27-year history of exhibition, publication and event making. And Innova being an agent for change, advocating for social justice through working with artists and their communities in order to diversify the mainstream of art history and education. We're currently exploring funding and opportunities to research and catalog key areas of our archive collections, mainly um, in regards to the documentation of Innova Setup, the, its founding uh, conference on new internationalism in 1994, our artistic programming specifically around the Vale Touring Exhibition, and also the digital project of XSpace. In the mid 90s, um, Innova uh, Modus Operandi was based on creating new forms of collaboration with artists, curators and writers from cultural diverse backgrounds. And in 1995, Innova began a three year project to research, develop and implement a program of exhibition and um, event projects using new technology and when Innova launched this website, which was then known as Innova Online in 1996, the XSpace Virtual Gallery, which was launched at the same time, became central to Innova's website. Um, XSpace itself was an innovative and uh, pioneering venture that provided an opportunity for young and emergent artists of diverse cultural backgrounds to work in collaboration with web designers and technologists to produce web specific art um, commissions. And this got launched with Simon Tagada's um, Fistigator, um, Indica Pereira's um, Drawing Machine in 1996. And other commissions include um, Joy Gregory's Blondes and um, Mary Evans Filter in the early 2000s. So XSpace provided an experimental space for artists to explore um, the potential of new technology as a medium for cultural production. And uh, rather than a means to transfer existing ideas into a new form, the hope was that working with technology, the artist's practices could be um, broadened. So currently the virtual gallery that was once XSpace is no longer has an online presence. And although information images um, are available on our website about many of the kind of digital multimedia projects that were happening um, during the early, um, well, mid, mid 90s onwards um, that were featured also in X space. Much of the elements and functionality um, were unfortunately is now obsolete, um, inaccessible or hidden. So I'm, I'm really, really happy to um, have the artist and filmmaker, Maybell Peters here to kind of talk us through um, her residency and her research, which is titled um, Uncannily Familiar, which seeks to examine the digital spaces operating between the familiar and the unfamiliar black body in an archive and question the multimedia, um, the metadata existing within the digitized information, specifically looking at X space. So 
Mabel um, is a practice-based PhD candidate at UCA Farnham and her practice focuses on storytelling using documentary historical events, literature and oral narratives. She has a BA in um, animation and uh, kind of commissioned films um, which have been shown extensively at animation festivals um, as well as kind of broadcast TV. Um, she's a recipient of the inaugural Women of Colour Art Award and her work has been shown as part of the exhibition The Place Is Here um, with Nottingham Contemporary and South London Gallery in 2017. And Maybell is joined by um, Gary Stewart, uh, who spearheaded uh, X Space and its digital art commissions. So Gary um, was Innova's former head of multimedia in 90, between 1995 and 2011. Um, and he's, he's an artist um, known for his reworking of historical and scientific archives, collections and ephemera that explore social and political issues. With Trevor Matteson, he's part of Dub Morphology, an interdisciplinary research group who through experimental approaches to sound art, live cinema and installation, explores culture, history and technology, creating projects that blur the boundaries between the sonic, visual and performative. He's also currently uh, artist uh, associate at People's Palace Projects. So I'd like to thank you both um, for being here and I'll pass over now to um, Mabel to facilitate this talk. Thank you Tavian and thank you everyone at um, Innova uh, and thank you Gary for agreeing to take part in um, in my first instance of this research project. So what drew me to the um, the idea of exploring this X space was that I was very unfamiliar with the X space, even though I'm familiar with some of the artists, which got me to question why some of the black artists kind of move into different spaces. So I'm very familiar with work by Donald Rodney, for example, and Keith Piper. Um, but the work that happened at X Space with some other artists, particularly in the 90s, when I was working in technology um, and as a, as a kind of art student, um, remain hidden. So one of the questions I'm trying to probe is how do black bodies move in spaces? So I'm, I'm thinking of that as, a, as part of my animation practice where I'm, where I'm looking at black bodies moving, but I'm, I'm thinking about the spaces in which black artists move in the physical and virtual space. Um, and because Innova was kind of, well, actually the, the work done at Innova was, was so innovative, I'm beginning to think, well, is it to do with the discipline that I was in, which was animation, that I've kind of missed what was happening at Innova? Um, so kind of the questions I'd like to ask Gary relate to the history of X space. Um, in order to find our way. So I'm trying to find my way to the X space as it was then, and also as it moves into the digital space, looking at how people came into that space. So Gary, one of my first questions was to ask, what was X space? Um, how artists found their way to X space? And if you could give us some background as to who those artists were, how they found themselves working with the different technologies and technologists. Thank you, Mabel. Um, it's probably worth setting some context first mm -hmm. in terms of what the environment was like in the um, mid nineties. I mean, it was a time of rapid growth in terms of computing, um, sort of like the integration of um, not just modern computing, but sort of electronic networks and related technologies in everyday life and media. So it's very, the things that we take for granted now were just coming to the fore, so to speak. There was great sort of like optimism, <clears throat> excuse me, optimism coming from the sort of like availability of cheap computing and um, the emergence of the, um, the internet. Uh, you have to um, imagine an inexpensive um, media production was, was becoming um, 
quite you know possible and um the access to potentially limitless audiences all of these things were were a completely new different um shift in a paradigm in terms of how artists were uh were thinking about potentially making work and um engaging with audiences so you, you it's also the mid the mid 90s is also a time of um sort of there's all these um laboratories that are happening um, by that i mean media labs there's um i'm not going to remember them all but there were significant ones like backspace in clink street which is not very far from tate modern which was um, a hotbed of sort of like um sort of um, artists and technologists all coming together in an environment where people were encouraged to 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 look at the sort of um the potential of computing outside of um, the kind of didactic and literal word processing financial spreadsheets database etc cetera, etc cetera. um there was also the sort of um, activities that were happening in places like the arts technology center artec but even the permeability between the sort of um, what i call the sort of commercial spaces which at that time were like the media labs at um, the guardian um the multimedia corporation which was a, a sort of like a, this bit of the bbc which was developing digital technologies those people engaged in those spaces were also interacting with um sort of um believe it or not activists and other people um all sort of hungry and thinking about well what do these new emerging technologies what can they afford in terms of um the artists in terms of the new new tools for new forms of expression so that's that's some of the context and of course innovate was already um, um by the time the x space was being conceived was already working in terms of a context of um artists thinkers and curators and activists activists who were already working through an international global network at, particularly outside of kind of a mainstream contemporary arts infrastructure and that's important to stress because um the x space project um, online space itself was also intended to provide a means to circumvent the kind of um, closed doors to the established institutions which hadn't readily embraced um, people of color so to speak so in other words uniquely placed really because it was not necessarily at that time thinking about merely establishing an organization around bricks and mortar but was thinking quite widely and discursively about how um its online presence and new media technologies might might be a means for artists not only to make work but also affect and be an integral part of the modus operandi of how the organization worked and by that i mean in terms of how the practice of curating and producing and exhibiting audience and audience interaction the, just the whole gamut of what it is to make contemporary art um in terms of the very first commissions well the process of the of uh, um the, the first two commissions in terms of Simon Tagala with his work Fustigator and um Indigo Pereira with the drawing machine well Simon Tagala was um was brought to the attention of Innova through the normal process of going to gallery visits degree shows etc and um where we became aware of his the work that he'd made which was called at that time a physical work called Fustigator and indeed when he was asked to make a piece for um the X space Simon decided to expand on that physical work but to create a piece which would enable a far more sort of um um a way of navigating the work through uh, i guess at that time there was this preoccupation with like clicking and pressing and kind of um hypermedia and non linear paths into work so i mean this is going to happen time and time again when we talk about work clearly it reflects the emergent technologies at the time and how the artists um sort of 
consider how that might in some way provide us some means to extend their vocabulary in that space. Um, Inde Pereira was interesting because um, he already had been um, asked to do a, um, an, uh, an artist in research project at, in Southampton as an ordinance survey organization. Uh, and so he'd already made a physical piece of, of, of work which was related to his research practice. In fact, he, it was a unique program from Innova where an artist was, was paid to do research and engage with a, a, a kind of like an, uh, an organization. And um, he, he decided he wanted to, again, investigate and explore this idea of a drawing machine, but to, to look at the limits of what could be done in terms of the physical and the virtual space. So those were the, the very first two commissions that happened in 1996 to launch the X space in the online. And, and as was said in the introduction to this whole session, Innova, the X space itself was very much primarily targeted at emerging, emerging young um, artists. And the idea was what would happen if you, if they kind of worked in collaboration with, we called them technologists at the time, <laughs> web designers or, or whatever, but, but this idea of a, a kind of collaboration and a, an exchange between two different, I guess, um, entities, so to speak, to create a new space, a new, a new piece of work in a third space, <laughs> you see what I mean? And, um, and again, I can't overemphasize the sense of optimism and like, the unique kind of environment that existed at that time, the excitement of um, the possibilities of um, creating space creating um, new work in a new space for new, new potential audiences. That, that's the interesting thing about Innova, that it saw the emergence of this technology and what it could bring for artists, but it also recognised that the artists weren't necessarily going to have the skills to carry out that work. So that importance of working with the technologists. So could you speak a little bit about how you find these technologies. I mean, I know yourself, um, people might not be aware of your own skills that you brought to this and, and, and your knowledge of that. So do you, do you then find these technologists who are interested in working with artists? Because how do you bring these collaborations together and how do you facilitate the work? Um, yeah, so... Hmm. Do you want to expand good, on how, how that yeah. happens? Well, of course, um, it's important to state, and I know it's painfully obvious, that um, many of the technologies, so to speak, are artists, if you see the read, mm -hmm. in their own right. Um, they just seem to, they just have a, a, fa a fascination and a, and a, a particular skill set in terms of, um, the, you know, that area of expertise that they have. Um, so, yeah, your question is a good one. I, I myself emerged from the Arts Technology Center, Arts Technology Center, Artec, which was a space which was specifically set up to explore and investigate the, the, the sort of um, creative application and potential for computing and, and arts and creativity. And at Artec, the um, Artec was part of a network, uh, I mentioned back, um, Backspace already, where there was um, people like um, James Stephen and Lisa Haskell and um, amongst others. Um, so there was, already, there was already an environment of um, artists and technologists creating work, so to speak. So there was a pool of expertise and people willing and eager to to try out different things. And indeed, um, you know, sometimes it was a, a very direct connection. So for instance, um, something like um, Anabiosis by Simon Tagala, 
um, Giovanni D'Angelo, the person who worked on that with Simon Tabala, came out of Backspace and was a very key worker there. Um, so there was a, this, this sense of um, generosity as well, which uh, again, I can't overemphasize between all these different media spaces because of Sutamina. You know, it's um, in a way that um, I guess currently is enjoyed by the um, um, sort of um, um, the, the environment that we, the contemporary environment that we have in terms of like um, open source, in terms of like people share um, their practices and approaches, etc., cetera. And, um, and they do that quite willingly without any, um, without asking for any kind of retribution in terms of money or whatever. That, that, was a, that was a spirit at the time. It was really quite amazing, if you see what I mean. And so there was no, there was no difficulty in finding people who were willing, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. What was far more fascinating and interesting was the, um, clearly the dynamics that emerged, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Clearly, I mean, what you have is um, obviously, it's a, it's a dynamic exchange, it clearly is. And, um, you know, a digital artist, I mean, you need the kind of sense of um, working process of um, means that it, it involves a high degree of sort of um, the ability to work within a framework that is sometimes determined by other people. Yeah. And, um, and that could be that could be quite difficult. And that happened quite frequently, if you see the reason. <laughs> and um, there's no doubt that that played a part in the sort of um, the way that projects emerged. And so it wasn't just, uh, as you can imagine, just a straight, you know, the, the technology is the hands and, and, and the sort of like articulating the artist's needs. It's a true and genuine exchange and, um, and collaboration between the, those people. And there were some wonderful moments again, where um, I can remember people like, say for instance, um, Mary Evans, when she did Filter, who she'd already created a piece of work at Leighton House, a physical piece of work. This is not unusual for Innova because artists would make pieces of work in one medium and then purposely that would then be made into an, in, say for instance, uh, educational resource, which is what happened with Filter. And then um, she was invited to make a CD-ROM. Yes, CD-ROMs were st still a thing then. <laughs> um, um, so this was like a physical piece of work, a CD-ROM, which, which is intended to, in some way, um, embody the work that she'd done at Leighton House, exploring signs and symbols and the specific collection there. And then she was invited to be, to do an X-Space commission. And, um, she did not want to do it. She was not, she was not a happy bunny, you know, sort of like she'd already created this wonderful work which had been um, received so favorably. And it's quite understanding in a sense, you know, this sense of um, rawness and opening yourself up mm. in a way that um, um, how will people, how do they know what I've done and not done? And can I articulate myself? Can I, you know, the nuanced, and the um, way that I do my work in a specific medium that I'm working in, mm. will this translate readily into this <laughs> electronic space, so to speak? Mm. Not happy. Anyway, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of introduced her to John Lundberg, who was um, an artist in his own right, but was working at the University of Westminster at the Hypermedia Research Center. And, um, they created what I think was an incredible project. It's an amazing kind of um, synthesis of their, their skills. And I think it's um, testament to both John and to Mary that they found a way of working which enabled Mary to extend her practice, but also John to, to create a piece that unfortunately cannot be seen right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean- I am gonna go on to talk about this. <laughs> See this up here, I'm, I'll just say it quickly, and then, you know, we, you can get us back on track. But um, John decided, John Lundberg decided, and it's understandable through sheer excitement to employ um, the, um, the scripting language in, in, a, in a browser called Netscape Communicator. Netscape was the prevalent 
web browser at that time. It only, it only just about established itself as um, a sort of like the artistic space because you could script and make, you could extend its capabilities beyond just showing images and sounds and video, you could create interaction. And so obviously he's, he's, a, you know, he's, he's an artist that is new technology. So he employed this um, very early form of what's called JavaScript. So that when you rolled over, the, the symbols would flicker and change and the, you could create this wonderful um, interactive game, which Mary absolutely loved and echoed the pieces of work that she, that she did, which only worked for a you know, particular amount of time in that browser, in that moment. <laughs> this is going to come up time and time again. <laughs> yes. um, I mean, that idea of working with the technology because it offers so much, um, and you see the benefit in that, but not being able to predict, you know, the, the lifespan of this technology, which, which is what happened when I started working with, with, um, with Lingo to be able to make CD-ROMs. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the future of being able to make something um, and now, you know, authorship was something that we thought was going to last forever. Um, and part of the reason why I took a photo of a, a CD-ROM that I made and called it Black History Month was mm -hmm. um, the fact that that's all I can do now because I don't have the, the equipment to, to play it. And it's done in lingo and I, and I locked the, the source code and I can't find it. So I can't, I, I don't even know what's on it, but, but that was part of the, the research question about this whole kind of precarity with working with this technology and then after a while it, it's kind of obsolete um, and then you have to think of something else but I guess that whole idea of creating a space at Innova, um, well the X space where yeah. people can come, you don't really think about it ending so while you were there and bringing in people, um, were you thinking about spaces that you could exhibit this work? I mean, you know, you've got access to all the tools and you can make all the work there. Mm. But what was the plan for being able to get that out to a, an audience so that they can engage with it? Yeah, again, that's a really good question. Um, frightening as it may seem, <laughs> there was, um, Back then, the world um, revolved around what we call portals. <laughs> These were like, I guess in contemporary speak, they were just merely links of interest, if you see what I mean. So you'd have like, a, it might be like a, a video portal or a web portal or a whatever portal. It was just an area and links to like-minded organizations or places or spaces that you'd go to as a jumping off point to then go and view the work. And um, at that point, Innova was probably part of um, a contemporary online art portal of about 12 or 15 organizations around the world. <laughs> it's frightening to think about. It sounds ridiculous, <laughs> but it's true, you see what I mean? So in a sense, you kind of knew where to go in order to see stuff. There were, other spaces which were called walled gardens. Um, they, those were places like um, AOL, um, American Online, sorry, I don't know if AOL still exists, but back then um, you not only had the, clearly the internet was always there, I would say it was there, you know, it was about like 20 odd years old, even at that point, or maybe 15 or something. <laughs> and you have, the World Wide Web, as we know, hosted Tim Berners-Lee, 1991, then providing a means to, to experience through a web browser, the internet. But there were other environments and AOL had a, an, a, another environment, so to speak, which is called the walled garden because if you went in there, yeah, it was richly kind of um, populated with with media and material and experiences, whatever, but it didn't relate to or link off with anybody else, if you see what I mean. Okay. And indeed, you see echoes of this even today, which is, which is quite, quite frightening. But answering your question, 
the work was being viewed in kind of like through these networks of known kind of links and, and portals, so to speak. So it is interesting that there were on occasion specific events that were set up where we get computers and put them into a physical space mm -hmm. in order to facilitate the means for audiences to view the work. And indeed, that was common practice. Um, so for instance, um, the photographer's gallery at that time, when they were doing projects, I'm talking about network projects, they would, um, uh, they would on occasion um, set up computers in a specific space and it would be, it would be timetabled and, you know, marketed and people would come into that space, sit down, <laughs> really kind of interact with it, you know what I mean? Um, I think they did a project called Taylor Four Cities where that happened, which was a network project between uh, four different spaces around the world. And then, then it'd be gone again, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it, it, would, it, was, it was not possible at that point. It's certainly in the early, when the um, X-Space was first launched, to be in your, your house, so to speak, mm -hmm. and to experience this, um, you had to go to a designated space that had the uh, appropriate sort of, um, well, basically not just a machine, but had a, it had a line so to speak, and a line that was fast enough. So Innova had what was known as a, as a killer stream, 64 kilobits per second, which is miserly <laughs> in today's standards, but was an amazing kind of um, line at the time, which meant that people could come into the space in Whitfield Street and experience the projects. Um, backspace that I mentioned had a 512 or something kilobit thing, which was enormous. And that's because James Stevens had this deal with commercial companies, if you see what I mean. That's what made the space so unique. Um, and then, you know, th th that's how it was. It was like the only way to really experience the work was in a purposeful way, if you see what I mean, at a designated time. Right. Certainly in the earliest days. And if you had the appropriate plugins. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the other thing, because I'm thinking about a lot of the artists at the time who would have, you know, gone on to whatever creative art degree. So they might have mm -hmm. been fine artists or they might have been uh, photographers. But I mean, in our previous conversation, yeah. I kind of noted that a lot of them were photographers. Yeah. Um, so was that because photography already had some kind of connection or were they artists that spoke to each other and found out about it? Yeah. Well, there's a number of reasons. One of them is, where do I start? We've got to say, we've got to mention David A. Bailey. <laughs> we've got to mention David A. Bailey because he's fascinating. David A. Bailey was, responsible for, he was part of setting up Artec, the Art Technology Center, but he's also part of the establishment of Innova. He's also, he was also on the editorial of 108 magazine, which was the preeminent sort of um, magazine at that time, run by Derek Bishton um, in Birmingham, which um, even prior to the um, sort of emergence of, um, grappling with the sort of uh, technology and new media. 10.8 had established itself as this amazing kind of um, publication looking at um, media theory mm -hmm. and um, had the likes of uh, Stuart Hall was involved with it, Roshni Kempadu, um, Armit Francis, I'm, I'm gonna miss out a lot of names, but <laughs> the point is, those photographers were already trying to get to grips and grasp with this sense of um, what um, Josephine Berry at um, Mute magazine, I mean, she, she noted, she called the photography the, um, the ultimate fiction 
machine because um, this, the, fact, the fact that, you know, um, historically ph photographers were already grappling with the, um, the, the sort of sense of had, he, had the sort of like exploration of, or contesting the sense of authenticity in the, in, the, in the photographic image, and which meant that they were really well poised in terms of um, with digital technology, the added layer of not just um, who edited it, when was it edited, uh, how images can be manipulated, undermined, verifying the authenticity and stuff. The fact that it's a kind of a common experience, but not coming from com common origins, it just multiplicity of different views and perspectives meant that they were able to bring and deploy a kind of critique to this space. And in fact, in 1992, Tenet created um, an amazing um, issue called Digital Dialogues, mm. Photography in the Age of Cyberspace. And, um, and on, that, on that editorial was a number of people, including, you know, mentioned uh, Roshi Kempidu, David A. Bailing, whatever, um, Andy Cameron, who sadly is no longer with us, but there was somebody who, again, was in between sort of like media theory, technology, photography. So you can see in that kind of context that it, not only is it because of people like David A. Bailey and others, if you see, but there's this clear permeability between those activities and then it just segues into sort of like the work at Innova, so to speak. And again, it's because those practitioners and those theorists and everybody in photography were right at the forefront of this. I mean, clearly, you know, within um, the moving image, so to speak, time-based media stuff was happening. But, you know, again, these theorists were able to begin to expand on their or on the vocabulary that they are already established in a particular field into the digital sphere. And I think that was significant. And it, it's why people like Roshni Kemper is an, an important figure. And why, you know, when she continued to do her work like a um, uh, virtual exile piece in, in 2000, which was commissioned by the watershed, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. it's, um, yeah, it's key. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's. I mean, that's that's the thing that you're you're mentioning all these these artists um, and photographers whose names I'm familiar with, but I'm familiar with in a very specific medium like photography. Mm. So this this is the thing that I wanted to find um, from the X space of yeah. these artists that started working with this digital technology, um, and also what it brought to their practice once they started working with it, um, particularly with things like interactivity, because mm. uh, then that's another way of thinking about how bodies move in a space, in this virtual space. Um, but also why they, say, didn't move into uh, maybe just doing interactive stuff on online, whether that didn't provide them with the same kind of exploration because you know the x space was there for x amount of years yeah whether because that that didn't go anywhere else whether that meant that the artists that were working with that technology just kind of left it and, and move on to something else um so i guess that's that's part of the research is to find out mm. what happened to those artists and, and whether there was any kind of replacement in, in that technology. I mean, I, for one, stopped working with interactive content because there was nothing else. And, and the web didn't provide me with the same way of working. I think that was mm -hmm. something really experimental that artists were able to work that way. And the collaboration not only amongst the technologies, but with the mm. technology itself yeah. had something about it. Um, so I kind of mourn those days. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping for something similar that happened um, and maybe through finding what 
what was there in the X space that something that I can, you know, maybe sort of bring into my own practice. Cause mm -hmm. I'm thinking that uh, animation holds something that was very kind of tempting with working with computers, but it was the interactivity specifically Mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm, no, I'm not really forming a question here. I'm just kind of <laughs> putting, putting in my own, my own thoughts to your, your responses to mm. actually letting us, allowing us to see, because that's the, that's the thing. I'm working remotely. Yeah. So I haven't even seen a lot of the work and I might not even get to the point where I can see your work because we, you know, access to, to equipment, but even thinking about those artists that were there, um, what other forms of technology beyond just the, the CD-ROM and the web space, you know, but like physical computing, whether, whether even that was something that was beginning to emerge, whether artists were beginning to think of that technology? Yeah, I think there were. I mean, there's a couple of, Thing, things I can probably answer there. I mean, um, okay, so again, I think it's important to, to stress that what was unique about the, the way that Innova approached curating the space was that it was less about the bells and whistles, the veneer of the technology itself, and more to do with um the substance <laughs> mm -hmm. um, by that i mean that it wasn't about the pursuit of the perfect pixel or the you know the the, the high bandwidth or the, the the best kind of sonic so to speak or the, you know what i'm trying to say <laughs> mm -hmm. what might be the equivalent today a 4k 8k rendition or something i don't know but rather these the intent was, and I think to a large degree it was successful, the intent was to create a synergy between these emerging young artists and the curators and producers and the, and a, and a young new organization and creating a symbiotic relationship where as those artists explored those spaces and these areas and new ways of working, that in itself would, riff, would um, impact on the way that the organization grew and developed mm -hmm. and perceived not just um, new media art, but you know, in terms of the contemporary art and, and, and its direction and its development, so to speak. So, you know, um, and it wasn't seen as a be all and end all. That's both in terms of the, the artists who were involved or the curators and producers and everybody else. And I think that was quite healthy. So mm -hmm. it wasn't like, it was the holy grail, so to speak, you know, <laughs> that this somehow was going to um, provide the answer to all the ills in the world. Indeed, you know, it's clear that, as I stated right at the beginning, um, the fact that um, Innova already had established this global network of writers, curators, thinkers, et cetera, et cetera. The development of work in that, uh, sorry, um, new media work in that space just extended and in fact, quite obviously um, contested those kind of spaces and in the way that they reflected the, um, the predominant sort of environment of, of access or non-access mm. and um, uh, of representation and non-representation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it was important to, to, to begin to grasp with these things. The other thing that was, um, clear is that these the very first works were right on the cusp of a um, shift between the paradigm of publishing and broadcasting mm. and the emergence of um, collaboration and social networking so yeah again in retrospect yeah it's so it's so obvious if you see what I mean mm. but as so happened, so happened in so many different media, we know through, you know, um, film 
was set up like theatre initially, yeah. quite literally, mm -hmm. if you see what I mean, mm -hmm. until new forms and new ways, new paradigms begin to emerge in terms of like um, that would um, sort of people could make new work that didn't merely rest upon the paradigm that being established in theatre. And similarly, within an immediate sphere, that's what happened. It was first seen as this um, means of extending kind of like publishing and broadcasting initially, clearly because at first it was still, you know, the CD-ROM medium, but even the early internet ones was very, were very much of that ilk until, you know, it wasn't Innova per se, but the environment began to really explore this in a different way. And uh, there are people like um, Ivan Pope, Heath Bunting, Rich, Rachel Baker, who are really, really key in beginning to establish a different way of relating to, to the net, which is not in a didactic and literal way, but it's about in time of new forms of exchange and communication. Oh, yeah, and of course, the guys that um, mute mute who became mute online, but who were initially mute magazine. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you know, start off as a physical paper, mm. and um, um, Simon Worthington, Pauline Van Brookman, and then going up to Josephine Berry. You know, all beginning to foreground and it's establish absolutely new innovative ways of working in a way that again and i'm not being idealistic or romantic but that side of the art sphere was not happening in the commercial world yeah. <laughs> at all at all they were not even thinking in that way if you see what i mean mm. and as history as we know what happens in history <laughs> commandeered by the commercial interest and indeed, a lot of these organizations like Backspace, in the aftermath of the dot-com collapse, they suffered. Plus, there was the, um, you know, the, rate, the rising property prices in London, et cetera. I mean, they were in Click Street, SE1, just in the shadow of the Tate Modern. Mm -hmm. That was an alternative space. You've got to go figure and think about this. Artec was at the inter intersection of City Road and Upper Street in Islington. Mm. Go find space there. <laughs> Can you imagine a space teeming? You know, I was working there as um, um, kind of, you know, um, in terms of running the, the multimedia space at Artec in what had been previously a coach house. <laughs> the spiral space staircase in the corner, teeming with artists and other people doing, you know, it sounds incredibly Romantic, but it was true, it was amazing, you know, with all this exchange of ideas and um, not just, you know, class proximity of um, sort of like, um, yeah, these ideas, it's sort of like, you know, doing work and, and whatever. So what people went on to do after that, it, I'm curious as well. I mean, I, I do know in terms of some people who formally went on to work at say, the BBC, if you should have mean, because they were much sought after, mm. or Illuminations, which was like a, a TV stroke um, kind of like broadcasting entity, um, the Multimedia Corporation, Chrysalis, believe it or not, Chrysalis Records. <laughs> it's like talking about, yeah, Re Chrysalis Records had a, a, had a, had a, a, a bit of it called the Chrysalis Group, which is just all about emerging new technologies. Mm, yeah. Artists and technologists would go to there as well. There was this interchange, you know, and they were sold to BMG or somebody or like that for like a like hundred million or something. I'm not making that up. You see what I mean? These, these are like mad days. Yeah. I mean, I mean similar with uh, Abbey Road, Abbey Road Interactive that, you know. Absolutely. And that, I mean, that is the thing that the commercialization of, of that happened quite quickly. You know the in the yeah absolutely and it's like um you meant you mentioned or you asked me about what you know what my prior what was I doing prior to in the event yeah. it's like yeah I was hanging out with all those guys if you should have mean both men and women who 
were right on the cutting edge of stuff, but were willingly um, sort of like, the, again, the spirit of generosity, if you see what I mean. That's, that's what it was like at that time. Because it was all, everybody was sort of like grasping with this, with this, with this thing. <laughs> a, yeah, that had a lot of comments. <laughs> um, but but that, that's what I'm hoping, you know, to see, to, to kind of remember the, that time when, when it was, when it was such new technology. <laughs> oh yeah, I just remember one of your questions. Yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Classic, Gary. Um, <laughs> physical computing. So, yeah, there was a lot. I mean, I mentioned Indica Pereira and uh, Simon Tagala. Um, yeah, if we go back to Simon Tagala, when he did anabiosis, I mean, it's incredible. So, for those who don't know, you know, a project where he was wearing a heart rate sensor from an organization called Polar which was transmitting his heart rate to a, um, a display at a place called Concord, Sylvania. It no longer is there, but it was in, um, uh, in central London, just off Tottenham Court Road. So it, it would simply say, Salming Tavala's heart rate is. And for 24 hours, all the time, it would just simply say what his heart rate is, if you see what I mean. And in addition to that, every day, a writer called Deborah Levy would would write a piece of text, this fictional piece related to how she, how she felt or thought Simon was faring in the world, if you see what I mean. And um, now this, now if you, you know, I'm mentioning, the, I'm talking about this project. If we wanted to do that project tomorrow, we could probably knock it out in about a couple of days with yeah. stuff just off the shelf. In order to do that project required uh, directly liaising with um, Polar, who were based in Norway or somewhere, something, working with this obscure, we still don't know, we think, it's, uh, we think it's, it was some um, defense contractor or something based in, um, <laughs> in, uh, in Battersea, who wrote specific software to, to kind of, um, it's called an API, application programming interface, to scrape that data from the Polar interface and upload it. We require it required um, special and um, kind of like um, network of um, uh, to be put in by by an internet provider for the connectivity. Um, I mentioned um, Giovanna D'Angelo, the, the, the programmer stroke artist from Backspace. It required his ingenuity and skill to put this together. There were just all these things. It was mad, if you see what I mean. It's like only um, a young organization as naive <laughs> as it ever would, would pursue something like that and pull it off, if you see what I mean. But, also, but I think significantly, it had the input of, you know, it's curated by Jelaine Tawadros and um, Melanie King worked on it and um, David Chandler and three of those people brought a critique, it does a very same critique and sensibility that they would do to any, any piece of work. So yeah, it was a new media piece of work on the bleeding edge, but actually it had to satisfy very particular stringent requirements in order to be an Innova project. And I think because of that, it was incredibly, you know, it was a really powerful piece. It was just really remarkable on so many fronts. It's mad though. <laughs> but the point is, yeah, there was several occasions, uh, not more, you know, the several times when artists were encouraged to and embrace this idea of working physically as well. In fact, that's what they wanted. To, they wanted to do both at the same time and they, mm -hmm. they moved between those spaces. And often it's not to say that they were able to articulate themselves in a way that they were satisfied. Um, Steve who did, who did his piece, wasn't particularly happy with it. Um, um, in terms of its final form as a as a net piece, when um, Flow Motion, the group, when they made um, their piece, um, and Flow Motion being um, Eddie George, Anna Peaver, and Trevor Matteson, mm. and and they made their piece. Well, I can't remember the name of the work. <laughs> yeah, somebody help me. Look it up on the net. <laughs> I'll look anyway, it up. It was based, it was based off Zabriskie Point. Um, mm -hmm. the film mm -hmm. um, 
And um, they made this remarkable physical piece, a projection, which um, sort of like celebrated the, the, the failure of that director to, 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 to establish his film after he'd made Blow Up, which was this enormous kind of like interna international success story. And um, Flow Motion, they made this projected piece, physical installation piece, which, which looked at the last five minutes of this, uh, this intense explosion in slow motion. Mm -hmm. It's quite mesmerizing and quite beautiful. And then they were encouraged because um, Innova had been awarded some money from the Daniel Langlois Foundation in um, Montreal, in Canada, um, to commission new X space artists and um, pieces of work. And so they were encouraged to make a piece of work. And um, I put them together with squid soup. And squid soup at the time were like, like they're even enormous now, but then they were like, you know, because we're in Old Street. Mm. And everything's kicking off, you know what I mean? Mm. So we're all sitting in the same cafe. We're, everybody knows everybody. I only have to walk two, three steps down the road. And literally, I, I'm with the most cutting edge kind of like um, technologist among, in the whole world, even, mm. you know what I mean? So Squid Super, Anthony Rowe was the person who worked on this, and he's, He's enormous right now, making work with all tech and God knows what, you know what I mean? Um, cut a long story short, no matter what Squid Soup did, nev it never worked. They were net, you know. And it was fascinating because whereas Zabriskie Point, the, the work that they did, which I can't remember what it's called, um, was this amazing kind of like um, articulation and um, reflected this, the, disintegration of pixels, so to speak, this poetic piece, squid soup, somehow kept on approaching it with these hard edge vectors mm. and, and kind of like, you know, that didn't seem to understand or couldn't translate this poetic piece into, which is not not because they don't make great work, because they do, but they just, they just couldn't square the circle. And that would happen time, time and time again. And it just, you know, just you know, try as we may, we just didn't really make a piece that really resonated mm -hmm. or articulated the way that the artist wanted to do. I hope I answered you okay. No, it, def it definitely, <laughs> I'm having a quick check on my, on my questions, but I'm also- um... Oh, I see, dissolve. Thank you. I should have read the chat. <laughs> It's called Dissolve. Yep. Okay. I'm, I'm also uh, looking at the time. Okay. As, as well. But I think, we're, I think we're good for time. I'm sure someone will tell us <laughs> if that's not the case. Um, are we all right for time? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Good. Okay. So I actually want to go back, Gary. Yeah, sure. Because we had the, we had a conversation last week, which was kind of like a pre-conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but it was to talk about your path to the X space. Yeah. Um, and also thinking about your interest in in art and technology. So physics and art, which kind of two paths but you managed to find a way to bring those together um but that you were also conscious of the fact that you found yourself in the fine art department mm. um which is an interesting thing of you finding your way to get what you needed um and doing it in a way that worked for you so mm. you want to kind of maybe i think we've got enough time to just go through that bit of your your interest and your education and you getting yourself into a place where you can benefit from your interest in, in yeah that. sure i mean the first thing to say is um i didn't plan any of it at all if you see what i mean mm. I, yeah, genuinely so yeah i was doing electronics and computing at trent 
but I trained Polly in Nottingham. But I was sharing a flat with Keith Piper and Donald Rodney. Um, Keith I'd known since I was age 11, because we went to secondary, uh, sort of a place called Mosley Art in, um, in Birmingham. So we'd already been known each other since age 11, if you see what I mean. Um, <clears throat> now, yeah, I, I liked doing electronics and computing the course itself, but I was far more interested in what was going on in the fine art department. Mm. Um, like way more interesting. And in fact, you know, I went through a particular crisis even prior to doing the um, <laughs> electronics course because I didn't even know whether I wanted to do electronics computing or to do art. At the time, the only way to, to do like technology and art or design or something was to do industrial design or architecture or something. And um, so we're talking 1980, mm -hmm. 1980, 1981. So it's like, you know, there's no multimedia courses. This is just, this is just, I can't marry the two things. The only way of marrying the two things is I continue doing my electronics and computing courses, which is what I did. And I continue to live in the fine art department, which is what I did, okay. if you see what I mean. And, um, and clearly that's not through, that's not through design. That's just through sheer fortune, and and um, it, it's you know it'd be um, uh, it'd be crazy for me not to say you know that the influence of um, proximity to Keith Piper and Donald Rodney and the Black Art Group, per se, you know, in terms of Marlene Smith, Claudette Johnson, Eddie Chambers, and, and the rest of them, wasn't an influence. Well, you know, it's, a, it's the making. For, it's it's a fundamental part of who I am, if you see me. So I continue to, to kind of like fiddle away making electronics. In fact, the course was hugely underwhelming. It was too theoretical. <laughs> I, had to, I had to do everything myself, which is fine because I'm still doing everything myself. So, you know, in terms of like putting stuff together in terms of electronics and DIY and all that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm already kind of like making quite cutting edge stuff, if you see what I mean. So I'm in a group called Turbo Black Arts mm -hmm. with um, Keith Piper, um, Andrew Campbell and Martin Glynn. And this group, Turbo Black Arts, uh, not only do we, it's a multidisciplinary group in Nottingham. So we're making like books of poetry. This is physical books, <laughs> if you see what I mean. But we're also doing performance and we've got a sound system. So, <laughs> You know, I make a computer for the sound, a, a, something called a complex sound generator for the ZX81 computer at the time, okay. Sinclair, yeah. which plays white noise and helicopter sounds to an echo thing for the sound system. So that's, yeah. that's fairly typical of the kind of things I used to do. In fact, I told um, Koja Eschen about this one time when we were having a group with the Otolith group. And he went, no, you didn't. I said, yes, I did. <laughs> Call it Keith or Andrew Campbell or Martin Clear. I mean, there's other people as well who can say this. But of course, there is no evidence of this. No. <laughs> we believe why, you, though. Why would somebody be taking a photograph or doing a video? You know, it would have to be pneumatic of me. <laughs> doing, um, I wasn't even using basic. I was using something called peak and poke. Peak and poke is where you have to, you have to write, like, it's not quite machine code, but it's more to the metal, if you sort of mean, in order to initiate the commands to then make the explosion, the explosion, the white noise, and shaping it through an ADSR, a tactic case, a sustained release. If you sort of mean. So basically, it's fascinating. I'm mentioning this at length because that's fairly typical of the kind of things that I still, that I continued to do when I left and I then went to, um, I got one of the um, Go Banking Awards, first ones. Um, for community artists and I went to Jubilee Arts in Birmingham and we were fortunate to receive an end of year grant which enabled us to buy a, a computers. <laughs> a kind of obvious choice now but back then it was like not so obvious. We spent a lot of money, this is Jubilee, on computers. It cost, it cost so much it was ridiculous. 
And this is testament to the director at the time, Sylvia King, who was amazing because she just, she said, what should we get? And I said, computers, because I'd been to San Jose's, uh, just outside of San Francisco to this conference and I came back and I was convinced computers is obviously to do. Mm. So we, you know, we're talking like 1985, mm -hmm. 1985, 1985 in fact. And we bought these computers and we got to desktop publishing. And in fact, there were two organizations that were doing a lot of stuff around computers in Birmingham then that were Jubilee Arts and 10.8 that I mentioned in terms of Derek Fishton. Then I'll just fast forward. So, you know, and fast forward to the late 90s, where, um, late 80s, sorry, where um, with Marlene Smith, we created, um, started creating a CD-ROM for the Sound Mother Health Authority around um, HIV and AIDS. So you mentioned Lingo, the programming language in Macromedia Director. So yeah, late 80s, started scripting stuff and scripting the CD-ROM. Then went from there to the arts technology in London, where I was responsible for running, well, first initially teaching, but also then went on to run the multimedia workshop, which I mentioned was the space for artists to, emerging artists to, to work. Yeah. And so it's all, it's all, honestly, serendipity, kismet and chance. I've not, I've not orchestrated any of this at all. And each time at each juncture, I managed to um, kind of like create networks and liaise with people who are right on the bleeding edge, if you see what I mean. Mm. And then um, continued to work at Artec and I was actually working with Illuminations, working with um, the Last Museum, on, um, which was a, another multimedia organization, um, Guardian, um, who had the new media lab at that time amongst other things. And then what was extraordinary about the opportunity at Innova when it emerged, when I applied for that job was, it was the opportunity to start again, <laughs> which I really very much enjoyed. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, I think it's, um, it's sort of like a ind indicative of this starting the game. When I, if I mentioned the, the, um, the web, I'll, I'll, how the web worked, excuse me, I'll, it's sort of in of our online. So like in my last year at Artec, we were working with an organization called GreenNet and it was like, they were on the floor above us and it was like a whole room of networked cables and servers and all the gubbins and this special line to, you know, to do, to um, publish stuff on the web. Mm. And in the interim period of applying for the Innova job and getting the Innova job and then, um, about this is about a year and then I'm and then setting it up and getting the equipment just spent 20,000 on a silicon graphics indie which just, just looked like it just looked like a, a, a pizza box a thick <laughs> pizza box that was on my desk in Whitfield Street with this killer stream which I talked which I mentioned before that was the whole web server and the web you know um we'd also design on it as well so Charmaine Watkiss, um, Joanne, more other and other artists and designers, they would sit at my desk and on silicon graphics. I'd be designing these pieces and working with the Xpage project. And it was also our server. Mm. I mean, it's mind boggling. You gotta understand, it was just sitting on my desk, neatly, if you see what I mean, like some minimalist piece of art. <laughs> it was beautiful. And it also enabled me to just rethink everything in terms mm. of um, like a reboot, if you see what I mean. Mm. And as I mentioned earlier, less about the bells and whistles and the, the veneer, more about the substance. And there was something about working at Innova, which was uh, terrifying and brilliantly liberating. Terrifying because I had to explain to Stuart Hall at every board meeting <laughs> what it is I was doing. <laughs> Go, why? <laughs> Uh, go blah blah blah. We, <laughs> we, you know, we do this project with with Jamie Wag. This is this is true. We're doing this project with Jamie Wag B fifty two. We're gonna he's gonna recreate a B fifty two bomber, but you'll only ever see grey on the screen because he's doing it one to one scale. And occasionally, if you scroll across, you might see a rivet. 
it's a conceptual piece. And you go, why? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, it was really good for me, you see what I mean? Um, not because, um, you know, it, um, the, the, the questions didn't have any merit. He was asking the right kind of questions, you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And he was he's ensuring that, in fact, the, the work that we're doing around multimedia was no different to any of the strands of, of the work at, at Innova in yeah. terms of what it is we were trying to achieve and articulate. Um, and that was that was hugely satisfying and terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> that was the most powerful board in the world. You got it. <laughs> you, you can't, you're talking Stuart Hall, Homie Barber, <laughs> Lola Young, <laughs> Chris Durkon, mm. amongst other people. Sarat, it's scary, but good for you. <laughs> no, that sounds amazing. It sounds like an amazing time, actually, that you're, I mean, you talk about the luck and chance, but I think actually you you probably made your luck by making sure... Well, that was a kind of glue between people, if you see what I mean. Mm. Um, do you know what I mean by that? Mm. So having a kind of like a, um, the sense, yeah, basically being able to liaise between all those different parties and of course who doesn't like spending money I used to like you know buying equipment getting cutting edge stuff being on on the forefront of technologies but also declining them in a way which um which which was you know which continues to this day in my in terms of my interest in in social justice if you see what I mean mm -hmm. so it's got to be for some reason I you know I'm like anybody else I I love an aesthetic project. I like to go into a space and just enjoy something just for the sheer aesthetic. But in terms of my own practice, um, that's what I like doing. No, that's great. Um, again, time check. How are we doing for? Yeah, we still we still have some time. <laughs> But uh, maybe we can also encourage people to, if they have questions, to start preparing. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm conscious of uh, making Gary talk for like a, a whole hour without taking a drink. So I've yeah. got a drink. Here we go. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yeah, if anybody has any questions that they want to put into the chat, we'll address them soon. Sure. Okay, well, we've covered the, the three areas that I was gonna talk about today. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, actually, some of the artists that you've mentioned that came into Innova and, and you did touch on yeah. going out and finding those artists, is there a sense that those artists were not only kind of finding their way through and you presenting that opportunity was ideal for them, but also finding an opportunity to kind of challenge them on what they could do? I mean, you mentioned Mary Evans of yeah. not wanting to do that um, yeah. and being able to- Initially, yeah, of course, yeah. And was that just kind of like you going out and doing the legwork and finding people or becoming aware of them through other means, like through what they were doing in galleries or what they were doing in their own work? Because it's whether those are all in formal spaces already. So they're already enrolled in a degree program. Mm. Um, so are there any creative practitioners that you're finding outside of those formal spaces? Um, yeah, I think um, it, it's all of those things that you mentioned there really, so to speak. Um, I think it's important uh, to, to um, recognize the way the programming meetings happened at Innova, if you see what I mean. And mm -hmm. everybody was encouraged to contribute 
to the kind of curatorial um, element of the online projects or new media projects that emerge. That's absolutely everybody. So I think some of the, I'm not just saying this, I think some of the best ideas and the best approaches came from people who had no so-called formal experience within that field, so to speak, or expertise. And I think it's testament to the way that um, uh, Jelaine, the director at the time, Jelaine Taradros had um, orchestrated and encouraged people to, to, um, to reflect and think about when they're conceiving of a project right at the beginning to imagine what potential ways this might be extended into the hybrid space that incorporates both digital and electronic technologies. Not as the be all and end all of everything, but, but just to simply consider at a very early point and to provide the means for that potential articulation. And so that, that would also extend to, you know, several of um, innovative associates or, mm. um, um, of course, you know, it's practice in terms of um, working with um, established curators, artists and agencies. We, so it would extend in that precise way as well. And it's probably worth saying as well that whilst we're talking about the X, the X space as the curated online gallery, the space that was primarily aimed at um, inviting younger emerging artists to create new work. Concurrently, Innova was also making work with established artists. Mm. Yeah, Keith Piper, uh, amongst others, if you see what I mean. Um, or, you know, or artists who were fairly established in another field, but we would be encouraging them to think about, well, well perhaps there is an online element that we can do here, if you see what I mean. And um, that, would, that would happen quite frequently as well. And again, that wasn't always, I don't want to use the word successful and not successful, because that's not the point, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. Because so much of this is, it's literally process driven, mm -hmm. if you see what I mean. And I, I can't, I don't know how to, um, I can't overemphasize that in terms of um, the, the intent in terms of um, creating these environments and opportunities is very much about um, an exploration, exploration of, the, of the means of actually producing the piece itself. It's not to say that you don't want a piece that emerges that can't be, that, that can't be engaged with, with the prospective audience and can't be critiqued and um, enjoyed or judged in a particular way, but the process was very, very critical Mm, yeah and, and not also that thing about a concertina not trying to just squash it you know you need things need to have a specific length of time a finite time in order to emerge appropriately and i think innova was really good at that because of its because it had this extraordinary program of creating unique spaces for artists as i mentioned artists in research artists in this, artists in that. <laughs> They'll be citing artists in these extraordinary spaces, offices, industrial spaces, um, pharmaceutical spaces, if you sort of mean. Um, it's like really extending this notion of what it, an artist residency is and a research project mm -hmm. and, um, and thinking critically about what those outcomes might be. So in the same way, we're applying the same sensibilities to the the sort of electronic media, so to speak, where yes, of course we want something to be really good, <laughs> particularly as the metric, the means of kind of like judging this by the um, the funding body, so to speak, mm -hmm. was very much still um, one based on, I guess today would be clicks or views or whatever, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Likes, oh my God, please. <laughs> <laughs> if you see what I mean? uh, so, Again, it, I can't overemphasize the way that this was an extraordinary catalyst and mechanism in, all, in terms of shaping the organization and the kind of um, reciprocal nature of how that worked. I mean, I think the fact that 
it was called a laboratory. Yes. So yeah, that, yeah, that meant that people mm. came there without any really fixed idea of what it could be. It was a place to explore. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And you know, okay, so I mentioned Backspace and Backspace amongst other places, that's exactly what, what they were trying to do. But the universe place was very much about a space of, um, but it talked about being a laboratory of ideas and previously unimagined, unimagined interactions between artists and the technologists. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's not preempting anything in any shape or form. It's very much, um, yeah, I haven't even, how could I talk so long without talking about risk? It's about taking risks. Mm. It's because it's such a common way of speaking today, if you see what I mean. But it was really innovative mm. back then. This idea of um, relinquishing, the artist relinquishing control and, 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 so to speak, all these areas, everybody, so to speak, and creating this environment of, um, that was conducive to, to shaping and creating new ways of working. And this was happening across many different organizations, obviously, not just, not just Innova. Innova was unique though, because I think it's illustrated by the kind of funding that it had at the time. Whilst there were many critics who said they, they just had too much money, Innova. Um, it's important to state that in the period um, that um, the new media arts grant was given to um, organizations across London from the Arts Council, which was, and forgive me if I get these figures wrong, but it's something like 1994 to 2004, something, it's like 10 years. Mm. Um, so there's like hundreds and hundreds of projects, quite rightly funded by the Arts Council. Extraordinary work and festivals and stuff, you know, the ICA, Seduce the Band and then the Hedgehog and Megabytes Festival, stuff but done by numerous organizations over that period, um, Roboski's further field, whoever. Innova only got one piece of money in that 10 years. Mm. And that was for Donald Rodney, Donald Rodney's piece, considering. Mm. So um, I think that's, you know, that kind of puts into context. I'm not complaining by the way, it's because the model was so unique at um, Innovate, but it was so such an integral part of our program making that, do you know what I mean by that? That mm -hmm. there wasn't this, whilst we did get other awards, I mentioned the Daniel Langlois Foundation in Montreal, and there were other awards that we got from other foundations for doing work in, and, and uh, commissioning artists to do work. The fact of the matter is in that period, there was only one project, and that was, um, you know, the work around the, the Donald mm -hmm. piece. So, and that was for like about, that was for like seven and a half thousand, seven thousand or something. So, I mean, so, yeah, it's testament more to the fact I think that this is so tightly integrated in our in our work, and uh, and uh, and so that was reflected in the money that. Um, yeah, which was actually a sizable amount of money that it was getting, it's no doubt about it, but it was an integral part of the organization's work. And as was stated in the introduction, um, the initial award which were in the first three years was to really look at this, establishing this model of what happens if you work on all these fronts at the same time, mm -hmm. you see what I mean? With a tightly integrated and um, work around new media, new technology, and curating work specifically in that way for it. That's great. Well, that's, that's pretty thorough. I mean, I think we managed to cover, yeah. well, you managed to cover, <laughs> like the, the history of... I must have forgotten so many things. I don't even, uh, people are going to complain afterwards. It's a long, <laughs> we need to remind people how long ago this was. If you see uh, well, that, that's true. We are, we are, <laughs> I am trying to prove. Years or something. All right, not 30, 90, no, 90, 96. But you still have remarkable knowledge. I mean, you are you are part of the archive, which is why it's kind of important for us to to probe. Um, but it 
it has enabled hopefully not just me but attendees today to to get some sense of what's in the archive but but how the archive came mm. in and and not just the artist but the 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 functioning scope you know the not only just the research that was done but mm. how it was facilitated i mean i think that was something that yeah and i don't want to sound like a broken record but mm. it's not just me if you see what i mean mm -hmm. again i have to emphasize um it was a huge privilege on my part to work with colleagues that I had over the course of 15 years mm. on, on the programs of work. And I get them all mixed up, so I'm not even going to begin, if you see what I mean. I merge them all together in terms of the different periods. <laughs> I actually do, if you see what I mean. Sometimes I just assume one colleague knew another colleague and they're separated by 10 years and they never worked together at all. I'm the common link, so to speak. But uh, the fact is, um, no, there's some extraordinary projects emerged, if you see what I mean. Mm. And it is, again, testament to uh, the curators and producers, researchers, numerous library staff who were like amazing, if you see what I mean, who embraced, everybody embraced it. Mm -hmm. Not to say that nobody found it challenging. Of course it's challenging. Yeah. It's incredibly challenging. Hell, I used to be in a program in meetings and, <laughs> uh, you know, um, I was famous for like, I, People have to explain to me every now and again, what are they saying and what are they trying to articulate in a particular project? You know, because, um, you know, my, uh, my art education only went so far, so to speak, so to speak, in terms of, you know, um, the theory. And, mm -hmm. um, and people were patient enough. And we, you know, we all worked together in terms of like creating this extraordinary kind of like, set of projects which as, as has been stated earlier nobody can see properly <laughs> at this present moment <laughs> so well, they, well, we're getting a really good sense of them they, um, and that's that's kind of a good start of that we're <laughs> we're imagining yeah and I, I do wonder you know whether i know it's come up but i do wonder whether we should um maybe i'm being naughty in, in suggesting that we just we just we just simply just say you know it was ephemeral it is here, yeah. it was here, and now it's gone, and that we can't translate, we can't capture it. I mean, it's like, it's really fascinating. It's fascinating to me, if you see what I mean, uh, yeah. not only because of the, pro the logistics and the practicalities of actually trying to recreate some of those projects. It's it, quite literally, I think, um, trying to, it's not just the environment and the context that they were received in at the time, trying to recreate that but also you'd have to literally slow something down or the response mm -hmm. of things or even like I'm thinking this is not really Innova it's really Arte just a couple of years before going to Innova you know when we started using images in the web browser I remember everybody in the workshop rushing around <laughs> to watch the image trickle down like this like a curtain <laughs> 320 by 240 pixels. I think it was 160 by 120. This tiny little window with awe. We were all like this. It must have been the same as like when they watched that first train and they dive out of the way like this, if you see what I mean, because they thought it was going to come through the screen from the first films. Mm. I mean, if you looked at it now, it would seem like ridiculous, if you see what I mean. But we were like, we were astonished. It was like, look, we've got an image. Or it would do that thing where it was like this crude pixelation. And then it would just gradually come in, come to focus and it gets sharper and sharper and sharper. Mm. It was extraordinary, extraordinary times, if you see what I mean. Mm. How, do you, how, do you, how do you recreate or represent that again? I don't know. Well, we kind of have through you talking about it. <laughs> we, get, we get a really good sense of, of what yeah. that was in a way that we wouldn't if we mm. looked at the image. So, you know, yeah. part of the retelling of the of those times, you know, as a way of capturing yeah. what went on. So, I mean, no, it's, it's great. It's, it's fascinating because also there's the artistic intent. I mean, when, for instance, Indica Pereira did Drawing Machine, and there were other projects as well, the artists are deliberately and intentionally trying to make the work unintelligible, difficult, obscure, challenging. They're playfully exploring the means of interaction that person is experiencing in the piece. Mm -hmm. This is on purpose, you see what I mean? It's not like it's not working. Mm 
Mm. They're reflecting on, rather than being frustrated with the speed or the way that something works, they're like, oh, this is fascinating. You know, what, what, what is, what does this mean in terms of like the perception of the viewer, in terms of authorship, in terms of the, the dynamics that's been creating here? You know what I mean? So they're intentionally creating what's it called, obfuscate the piece itself to make it unclear and unintelligible. And you know, that, that's a nuance, you know what I mean? That mm -hmm. It's important to really communicate and not simply misread. It's a bit like, um, um, you know, once filmmakers went past the persistence of vision and 24 frames per second and the so-called so -called magical illusion of motion and then thought, well, well, I quite like 12 or 15 frames per second. There's this liminal space in between this frame and this frame. And actually there's something psychologically, something different happening here, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. It's not helpful for me to have this thing kind of uh, go at a certain speed. Or the common practice, and this is real, of um, current gamers who they seek out CRTs, cathode ray tubes for you people who've got your flat screens. Why do they do this? A cathode ray tube is a really heavy, big thing. You see what I mean? However, it uses interlaced images that in relation to the kind of colors that it uses in terms of the RGB palette and the types of game playing experience are all part of the total experience. Mm -hmm. You start putting that on a flat screen, no matter how expensive it is, which rasterizes the image in one continuous way without interlacing it, which has an entirely different color palette and color space, does not represent the work in the way that the artist intended or designer. Mm. So all of these things are really critical. The fact that, you know, the fidelity of sound point sources, not, you know, deliberately frequencies within a particular dynamic range, they're all part of the psychological rendering of the piece itself. Oh. Oh. All this is, is intentional. You can't then just suddenly expand it out into a space and whatever. That's a, that's a different piece altogether. That's not the piece. So it really does fascinate me and, um, you know, um, I still, have fun memories of uh, Mark Booth from who's B3 Media now, when we got our, our grant, our travel grant from um, the Arts Council to, yeah, as I, men I mentioned, San Jose, you know, to go to San Jose, <coughs> excuse me, et cetera. And um, Los Angeles to um, high definition, a place there. And uh, we had to set, we, we, we had to go to, um, we had to set up something called See You, See Me with um, in San Francisco, which meant that we had to tell them when to broadcast the video, <laughs> we get on the plane, <laughs> come back to London. <laughs> then we had a little video window back in London and then they would broadcast it. <laughs> it should have been, it's just, it's mad. It doesn't, I don't, I, don't, I really don't know how to, it's so difficult to communicate. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's the thing that of the, those times when you had a technology that you really yeah. had to wrestle with, which you, you know, we still have to wrestle with the technology. I mean, yeah, in different ways, but um, Exploratorium. Sorry, it's just come to me. Exploratorium. Exploratorium. <laughs> that was the place. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> so do, we've got some questions. Uh -oh. do we? This is trouble. Yes. yes. <laughs> <Classes. laughs> we have a question from Pip. Uh, maybe I can just read that and then yeah. Pip uh, is here or wants to, to jump in. Um, so Pip is really interested in mm. this tension between the X space commissions being given a moment and how those works might have value now. Mm. Do you think the fact that you were looking for artists to explore a digital space who might not have used it before or after made these works made these works less likely to enter into histories of new media art? And yeah. what would be the value of making these works accessible again now? 
yeah, great, great. Question. Yeah, I'd love to hear directly from some of the artists. Strangely enough, I had I had dinner with um, Indica Pereira about it's a long time ago now, maybe six or seven years ago. I hadn't seen him for like ages, and we had this meal, and uh, he was he. He was not happy with his piece at all, but also he did not pursue art. He was like making he was making hotels in Indonesia or something. If you see what I mean, <laughs> which is fascinating. Um, I I would dearly love to hear from many of the artists themselves. Um, you can see the intent on Inver's part, if you see what I mean, and I think that's a really great question, <laughs> especially to say the, the tension. Um, I would love to dearly, and you know what. When I think about it, because when I did the, the talk, which was some time ago at NetArt at Tate, when I was talking about XSpace, um, I, I had to do some research about XSpace myself, obviously, because I hadn't looked at it for ages. And I was looking at um, um, numerous people who worked on it, and they cited it on their website. So if you look at Mary Evans, who is, she's a properly established, she, was but she's like a hugely established artist, international artist. She still cited the X-Space project. Um, Miss Robbins, I can't remember her name, who did um, the, knit, the knit, the one on around knitting. Forgive me, I can't remember her name. Um, it's on her website. Una Walker, the Irish artist, it's on her web. Basically, oh yeah, um, Jamie Wagg cites it. There's, bas there's a lot of people even Simon Tagala, who's a huge artist now, has got um, Fustigator and Anabiosis cited. So it's clearly people, people are really hugely proud of even these really early ex explorations into the medium. And these are, really, you know, these are properly established artists, if you see what I mean. <laughs> we could have just simply <laughs> moved on from this, if you see what I mean. Um, and that's that's quite gratifying. Certainly, when I when I saw that, I thought, "Oh, that's really interesting." Do you know what I mean? It's like they cite it. Um, Traveller's Tales doesn't isn't on. Um, uh, I can't remember his name's website now. Sorry, this is a senior moment. Um, but you get the principle of what I'm talking about there. If you should have been in terms of. Um, I would dearly love to hear from other artists as well, if that was possible, how, how this sits within their, their, their current body of work, if you see what I mean. Did that answer that? I wonder. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, it would be nice here to expand this conversation uh, further um, as well. I do, I do have a question. Um, mm. Probably a bit more about the kind of digital preservation of um, X space itself, mm. where we, we get, you kind of touched on the kind of obsolescence of technology. But yeah. how would you like to see maybe X space being reengaged with, or uh, maybe even redeveloped? Is that something that you you've thought about? Me personally. Yeah, in terms of like, as you say, like you want him to revisit the history, do you think it could be redeveloped in some new way today? Um, I don't know. I mean, I mean, when we had our preacher, I mean, this is why I've welcomed the opportunity to be here. And, and it's really great hearing from Mabel in terms of her, you know, initial thoughts as she starts her research, if you see what I mean. And I'd like to hear from others. Um, I think they're much in they're much better situated in terms of thinking about how it might, the contemporary reading and reception of the work might happen, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, as you can see, I quite, <laughs> I was being quite serious. I quite enjoy the ephemeral nature of it. But then I, I've gone on to pursue, having left Innova, the ridiculous profession of making real-time performance installations where, you know, only happen after like a month long residency for one night. I mean. Who would, who would seek and do? Who would do, who could go and do that as a profession? If you should me to make a living, if you should me. So I'm the worst person to ask. <laughs> Although I do continue my preoccupation and interest with working with archival material, ephemera, and collections, which are really important to me. You see what I mean? So on the one hand, 
I'm I'm happy and content in the knowledge, obviously, because I lived it and experienced it of, of the piece itself. And I, um, of course, I'd, I'd love for other people to get an insight into how those artists were creating really what I think was quite groundbreaking and innovative work of the time, if you see what I mean. Um, how that might happen, I don't know, but um, <laughs> I'd be keen to hear from other people and contribute in any shape or form that might be required. Yeah, thank you. And um, for Mabel, seeing as Gary's already kind of touched on the um, on my own, my second question, mm -hmm. yeah, what do you think your next steps will be for your research? Um, I'm still keen to not actually look at the archive yet. I'm still interested in those artists that found their way into the archive and and how that so so hearing from the artist as well um because what's quite significant gary is you mentioning yeah. those artists putting up their um on their website yeah that work um so clearly it it has like a, a significant point in their practice mm -hmm. um but finding finding the way to the archive is via other people. I'm I'm pretty sure of that. Whereas when I started, I thought it's just a question of looking at what's in the archive. Mm. But I think finding my way via other people is is an approach that up until today I was still kind of working out what that that approach should be. Um, and I also mentioned a book that I was reading. I was reading. Kai Miller's um, collection, the cartographer tries to mm. map their way to Zion, mm. where it's looking at cartography and, you know, methods of map making mm. and how we are used to finding our way through these maps, but what do these maps actually map out? You know, they, they, they map out these courses, but there are other ways of navigating. Mm -hmm. So that's my research. Mm. area that's my interest of finding alternate routes to a space mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting actually i look forward to it <laughs> well i'll be we'll definitely be talking more uh, about <laughs> this because you 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 have a lot that that you kind of hold you know with memories but also picturing you know what whilst you're talking you're you're picturing those places and those spaces which yeah, aren't always available to someone if you you know look at a picture and you and you try to imagine so the the ways of asking questions as well is a way of of finding ways to map yeah thank you and i don't think there's any more questions in the chat mm -hmm. so you're happy for me to wrap up um yeah Okay, uh, yeah, so thank you both for this kind of insightful talk and giving me so much further context um, about uh, X space and, you know, especially during the time in which there's so much rapid growth in terms of technology. Yeah, um, of course. Yeah, there's just so much there to, to think about. And also, um, it's quite <laughs> it's quite gratifying to know that um, the way in which the programming meetings happened is not dissimilar to what's actually happening right now <laughs> in terms of us, yeah, having actual staff being involved yeah. and then getting feedback from um, other staff, um, staff members as well. It's still mm. the same way that we work today. Mm. And, um, it's great that you mentioned... Um, uh, David A. Bailey, because we yeah, do his archives. Yeah, so sure. interesting to know, um, like for, for me to kind of like look through that and see how much of, um, you know, him being part of the kind of editorial team for 10A kind of featured in that um, archival work, mm. or if it's just specifically um, the kind of publication and curatorial work that he did at Innova. So that's sure. something else for me to. Um, <laughs> Omnipresent. You'll find his. You'll find his presence throughout. Yeah. Oh, kind of a, quite a large common fundamental denominators, David A. <laughs> yeah. And also, 
I really like what you also said about um, the kind of poetry and publications from Turbo Black Arts Group. So yeah, you should look that up. Vive, Vive Oyasa is the first one that we did, and then um, the subtle Re the subtle racist top ten was the second publication. So that was the first grant we got from East Midland Arts in um, nineteen eighty three or so, eighty four, eighty three or eighty four from um, the literature officer, Hugh Champion. And it was really quite funny because we, we all kind of, um, we jumped into this, um, it's called a Sherpa van. It's a bit like a transit van um, from Nottingham. And we drove over to um, either Ashti Delizuch or something like that, somewhere wherever East Middle Arts was. And um, Martin Glynn in his classic performative style kind of like banged on the door and went in there, and went 400 years, 400 years, we want a grant. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you have here were rather um, patient and said, uh, this is the process by which you um, apply for grants. And, uh, so <laughs> explain to us what exactly you do. And uh, we applied for the grant and we got it, if you see what I mean. And indeed, that's how I got into um, what became Desktop Publishing because I drew the, the short straw and had to print the book. So I went to this place called Nottingham Community Arts Centre, which is now New Arts Exchange. It's mm -hmm. on the actual site in Nottingham. So I basically went in there and said, got this grant from East Midland Arts for a book of poetry. We've written the poetry. Can you print it, please? And they said, that's not quite how we work. We teach you how to do it. And so I learned Reaper Graphics. I did um, the you see me, mm. and then ended up working there. <laughs> it's crazy. And that's when I got the Gulbenkian Award. Do you see what I mean? That's what I mean by it's all sheer chance. But yeah, yeah you should. You know, the way into how you got to X Space is very much inspirational. You wouldn't, you wouldn't expect kind of going from an electronics course to um, mm. just being in the proximity of art and so many artists that you mentioned, like, you know, Keith Piper, Don Rodney, mm. especially during that, um, you know, the time in the 80s. It's like. Yeah, it's an extraordinary time. Yeah. yeah chance, but um, it's still you know, inspirational to, 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 to hear about that. Um, and well, like I said, it was a privilege for me to be around. I mean, yeah, I literally was just around. <laughs> People will do, which is true. Which I is know about, you know, <laughs> just walk casually walking by. Um, <laughs> I, that's what I was trying to probe, like that you're, that you're finding your way, mm. you know, you're finding those spaces. Um, seeking them out in a way that that works for you i mean you could quite mm -hmm. easily have just not found the fine art department and and you know just done your electronics but clearly there was something missing from that that, that needed that's how i got into music as well well i was doing music yeah. before but there was um the technician there jan kapinski in the fine in the fine art department in in bonnington in the building and he basically invited myself and um, a guy called Oni Rodadas to come in and do experimental music making, which is what I do to this day today. And I still work with Oni, which is right. like, this is what I mean by, you can't make this stuff up if you see what I mean. Mm. It's by virtue of being in that fine art department and being in proximity to other people and other practitioners and being exposed to their work. Yeah, but even when you when you said about you know the amount of people that kind of benefited afterwards from X Space and their mm -hmm. skills being used and you know ingenuity yeah. in um, multiple other um, work, even if they might not have gone into uh, or continued with um, kind of the process of making. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, in terms of yeah going forward, I, I I like the idea of us you know having another talk essentially, or maybe with these artists that um part of X space but um yeah to, to delve even, even further into yeah, um, the archive as well so I'm, I'm looking forward to what further research um well the actual research that um <laughs> people will do do we have do we have time for one more question i can i'm just scrolling th through i can see diane simmons man you're lurking diane <laughs> where's your question <laughs> do you know who diane simmons is don't you <laughs> Donald Rodney's partner. Oh, she's uh, left on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not lurking. I'm just saying thank you. It's oh, so, 
It's so fantastic to hear you speak, Gary. It's just oh, um, it's lovely to see yeah, you. Yeah, just mm -hmm. just just an amazing uh, conversation, and and really look forward to you know more projects and the book and all these interesting conversations between yourself and everyone there at Innova and researchers. Just um, that's nice for you to say that. Too. Yeah, it's just nice just. To uh, <laughs> and um, and it's so it's just amazing the way that you describe those first moments and without that without that sort of piece of your insight and that piece of storytelling um, it just brings it so much to life it was yeah thank you everyone fantastic great thank, thank you, you I'm gonna go now <laughs> <All right. laughs> take care <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, so yeah, that, we've come to the end of our um, of our talk. So thank you everybody for being here today. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we as this talk is recorded, we will upload it um, very very soon after this. Because yeah, we'll get the corrections then, Gary. That was the wrong year. You forgot such a. <laughs> but but that, I mean, I think that great. all helps. That all adds to the to the knowledge exchange. You know that kind of feeds into the research. But um, I. Thank you so much, Gary, for, you know, your knowledge mm. is just expansive. It is like that virtual space where we can just keep on finding new ways of exploring the X space. So thank you so much. And thank you for everyone. To, um, no, thanks for the invitation. I really enjoyed it. It's good. Yeah, thank you. And there is a, um, there is a survey in the chat if anyone has time to um, fill it out and give us some feedback from this event or anything else you want to see come from um, this event as well. But thank you very much and give a round of applause very silently. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.